All right, good morning, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. My name is Dr. Kernut, and I'm the chair of the English department, for those of you who don't know me. It's been my honor for about 20 years now to help uh, present a prize that uh, is endowed in our department called the Hall Waters Prize for Excellence in Southern Writing. Uh, each year, we uh, honor a playwright, a novelist, uh, sometimes a songwriter. And this year, we're very excited to be uh, exploring poetry uh, and the gift that that represents in our culture. This year's recipient of the uh, Hall Waters Prize is uh, one of the most decorated uh, living American poets. And when I say I think he has literally won every prize in American poetry, I don't think that's one of those bad uses of literally that we try to prevent you from doing. Terrence Hayes was born in Columbia, South Carolina, attended Coker College, played college basketball for four years, and then discovered his true muse, which was art and poetry. And the microphone pops a little, so you may want to stand back from it just a bit. Um, he has published eight books of poetry in a career that spans about 24 years now. I want to note for you aspiring writers that he was, I think, 28 years old, maybe, when your first book of poetry came out, maybe 27 or 28, and he's just had a phenomenal career. Uh, when folks talk about who is the cutting edge in American poetry, his name comes up over and over again. And I just want to note for, in terms of uh, the prestige of the awards, there are two that really stand out. Uh, one, was, one is the National Book Award, which he won for his uh, edition of, uh, or his uh, poetry collection called Lighthead from 2010. And we're also, and I think this marks the first time that we've ever had a recipient of this award on our campus. In 2014, he was awarded a MacArthur, what's called a MacArthur Fellowship Genius Grant. And that is where uh, a recipient in the arts receives a, uh, a fixed sum of money over the course of a few years to really pursue his muse in uh, his chosen field. It is probably the most prestigious honor in uh, the American arts. And again, I believe this is the first time we have actually ever had a MacArthur uh, genius on our campus. So we are very honored uh, for that. Um, the students that you see up here are in my senior seminar, and they're, they're all getting ready to graduate. And they've spent about the last five months working on uh, Professor Hayes's uh, career, all of his books, all of his essays, even uh, his short story that he published in a Collection of Noir. Uh, and we're focusing, the, the, the most recent book, it, it's an interesting sort of conversation because we kind of fell, this award kind of fell right before, about two months before his latest book is coming out called So to Speak. And he's going to be talking a lot about that. And the book we have uh, for you to think about and I think it's a very important book, is called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. And I think one of the goals we'd like you to think about uh, as you have a conversation with Professor Hayes is what is the role of poetry in everyday life and in American society? There's a lot of key words in this book that we've been focusing on. Obviously, with sonnets, we have art. Assassin, we have violence. Past, we have history. So a lot of these poems are artistic takes on the history of violence in America. And I think one of the overall aims of the poetry, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I probably am, uh, one of the things that this book demonstrates is that poetry is a very effective tool for understanding both our past history of violence and our perspective on how we create a better future. So without further ado, I want to welcome Professor Terrence Hayes to Troy University and just say what an absolute honor it is to have you come all the way down to Pike County, Alabama and be with us today. 
It's really good to be here, y'all. Since they're going to do some questions, I don't feel like I should talk too much. <laughs> should I call you Kirk? Should I should, Professor, thanks. It's been great just even a ride down. It's been great. I'm going to get into it since we're doing Q&A. So what I have in the Book of American Sonnets that I'll start out with, let me do my timer, is um, a bunch of poems that I'm kind of trying to define what I think it is, the American Sonnet. Again, we can talk about it later on. English sonnet, Shakespearean sonnet, what would be an American sonnet? So one on the back, and there's a couple of times inside of the book when I'm writing these poems and asking myself what it is. So yeah, I'm looking forward to talking. I uh, hope I don't bore you. It's really great to be here. I'm from the South, so this is not strange to me. It feels like I'm home. I grew up, I spent a couple of summers in like Fort McClellan, Anniston, Anniston, Alabama. My dad was in the Army, so I know who y'all are. Okay. <laughs> So they all call the same thing, too. So that could come up, but they're all the same titles, so I don't have to think about titles. And I say to people, this is going to be the only thing I'm going to say, it's like if you meet somebody named John Smith, that, you, know, you don't expect every John Smith to be the same. So even though they have the same title, the title is different depending on the day that I wrote it. But here's one of me trying to tell you what I'm trying to do in the book. Uh, it's on the back of the book. An American sign up for my past and future assassin. I should also say like the you, if you don't hear a whole bunch of poetry, so it's like I lock you in an American sign. I am thinking of somebody. Like I started writing these poems. See, we ain't gonna have time to get to do any poems. I'm gonna be talking. Um, right at the beginning of the Trump administration, I was gonna write them for four years, and then I, my editor was like, you got enough after two years. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking about America. Maybe I'm thinking about a person, an entity, and I also say like one of the things that I think, you know, I'm exploring if it is something like violence, it's like American sonnets for my past and future assassins, so it's love poems for somebody trying to kill me. So there's something in the middle of that that I'm really kind of getting at. Okay, so I'm just going to read them. I'm going to stop talking. I'll read them and then we can talk. I lock you in an American sonnet that is part prison, part panic closet a little room and a house set aflame. I lock you in a form that is part music box, part meat grinder, to separate the song of the bird from the bone. I lock your persona in a dream-inducing sleeper hold while your better selves watch from the bleachers. I make you both Jim and Crow here. As the crow, you undergo a beautiful catharsis trapped one night in the shadows of the gym. As the gym, the feel of crow shit dropping to your floors is not unlike the stars falling from the pep rally posters on your walls. I make you a box of darkness with a bird in its heart. Voltas of acoustics, instinct, and metaphor. It is not enough to love you. It is not enough to want you destroyed. So that's one of them. That's sort of like me trying to define what the form is. Here's another one. And again, like if at the end of that poem I'm saying, it's not enough to love you. I'm thinking about America, right? I can't like all the way love you, but I also can't be like burn you down. That middle ground is usually what I think, how I felt, you know, when I was writing these poems. So this one in a different way is doing that. And you'll hear that, like that middle floor. But one of the things I want to do for you today is just talk about how sometimes I'm just doing different voices. So this one, I think of it in the voice of like a preacher. And depending on how good I feel, like sometimes I start sweating if I do it. So let's see. You hear the words, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. Our sermon today concerns the dialectic blessings in transgression and transcendence. We're on the middle floor where the darkness we bury is equal to the lightness we intend. We stand in the valley and go to our knees on the mountain. One rope pulls a body down and into earth and the other pulls up and after stars. To be divided is to be multiplied. Let us ponder how it is that you and I have remained alive. Mississippi and all the seas bound to sky by rain, the root 
and reach of all the trees. When the wound is deep, the healing is heroic. Suffering and ascendance require the same work. Our sermon today sets the beauty of sin against the purity of dirt. Here's the one, you can see how this will follow it, like if you're interested in how people put books together. It would make sense that after that one, I would write this next one called American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Something in the metaphor of the bow, which is never close enough to see the arrow hit its mark. I remain a mystery to my father. My father remains a mystery to me. Christianity is a religion built around a father who does not rescue his son. It is the story of a son whose father is a ghost. No one mentions Jesus' sister. Nothing is written about her. She had no children. She was in her 40s the first time she turned water into wine. A late bloomer, she began a small wine business and traveled all over the world selling the wine. Her name was the name of the wine. I don't recall the name of the wine. Here's another one. Kind of like, almost like a little riddle. American sign for my past and future assassin. This word can be the difference between knowing and thinking. It's the name people of color call themselves on weekends and the name colorful people call their enemies and friends. It used to be the word for the absence of inheritance. Before that, it was the word for the feel of burlap. When Lincoln witnessed the slave auction in his boyhood, it was the first word to enter his mind. Before it evoked a kind of bewildering mothering, it evoked Job's afro silvering with suffering. It is the difference between cursive, tantrum, assault, and pepper spray. It is the title of that absurd three-act play where the actors say nothing but who can say and who can say who can say for two hours straight. Who can say? Who can say who can say? Who can say who can say? Who can say? Let's see. Just a few more from this, and then I'll read you like one or two from the new book, and then we can talk. Let's see. Here's another one that's kind of trying to define what I think uh, the American sign it is. The song must be cultural, confessional, clear, but not obvious. It must be full of compassion and crows bowing in a vulture's shadow. The song must have six sides to it and a clamor of voltas. The song must turn on a compass of language like a tangle of wire endowed with feeling. The notes must tear and tear. There must be a love for the minute and the minute. There must be a record of witness and daydream where the heart is torn or feathered and tarred, the death must be undone, time diminished. The song must hold its own storm and drum and shed a noise so lovely it is sung at sunset weddings, baptisms, and beheadings henceforth. So the book's out there. Y'all can read this rest of stuff on your own here. Um, is there anything else I want to read in here? I mean, I got some more naughty ones in here too, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, let me read you. So, so what I thought I would do is, you know, I kept writing them. Um, I was going to write them for four years just to keep myself sane. And um, I turned the book in and I kept on going with them. So I'll read you a few where I'm trying to do something different. So uh, again, I just, we want to tell you these stories. I went to this, I went to see this movie, the documentary on Aretha Franklin. And there was a scene where she, you can probably get this on Netflix now or, or Amazon or something. She's singing like one of her most amazing songs, Precious Lord. And like even the people on the choir are falling out. It's so good. You know, the, they can barely keep up because she sounds so amazing. And then when she's done, they show the audience and people like falling out, passing. And there's one little girl up in the front row and she's sleep. You watch it, you'll see. So I was like, man, you missed that moment. So then I was like, but what if like as a young person, you know, you're, you were a person who missed all those kind of magical moments. What would you be when you grew up? You might be, you know, anyway, okay, you might be the, anyway, okay, American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. So on that, seeing her sleeping and thinking about missing God moments, I was writing this, thinking about, you know, the president, essentially, the president at the time. 
And so what I'm gonna say to you about making poems is I decided I wanted Aretha Franklin to be doing a duet with Nina Simone, if you know either one of them. So like, if you can imagine if something like that had ever happened, that's what poems would do for you, to pick up this idea of like where poems come from. So here we go. When Aretha and Nina sang Mary Don't You Weep into the same mic, levitating on stage, the future dictator, age six or eight, ward of a black maid for a Sunday, was asleep. We pine for a timeline wherein he remains awake. The tiny yellow flowers, yellow sparks, and yellow jackets swarming out of the mouths of the divas in this dazzling, undocumented happening distracted no one attached to their singing. No one saw when one woman took the other by the hand or what happened between them when they let go. Some guess a celestial rope or roadway or the disembodied robe of Lazarus, or one of them held the head and the other the tail of the snake being returned to the garden as if nothing could be holier than forgiving him. In any case, the future dictator was not awake. Okay, how about I'm gonna give you two regular poems and then I'll finish with one of the sonnets that I thought was gonna be the last one in this book. Uh, here's one that's a little more fun. I was watching this movie. We can talk about it later with my dad. This poem is online. Um, and uh, we saw something happen in the movie and then they, it was a, a, a clip. They call it continuity problems in movies. When you see something happening in it, they don't fix it, if you know what I'm talking about. So this is about that um, and other stuff. I'll tell you what the movie was later. Okay, continuity. You can hit the clue, this really was started in the movie somebody's getting in the cab and then they give somebody a cup and in the next scene they do the cup thing again so they didn't edit it right okay so that's what happens at the start of the poem before getting into the cab she hands him a cup then after they kiss she hands him the cup again as they walk she hands him a man-made substance then after they kiss she hands him the cup again she hands him a chalice of lightning and he hands her a chalice of fire then, in the next shot, after they kiss, they exchange chalices again. When she goes to the metal detector, she carefully places a pair of hoop earrings in a plastic tray. But when she retrieves them, they are two silver bangles she fits to her wrist. When they climb from the cab in the rain, her hair is wet. But when they kiss on the sidewalk, her hair is dry again. After she takes off her helmet and breastplate, and enters the water wearing nothing but courage, she says to him, you are nude, but you must be naked to win. But the subtitles read, to survive, you must bear the heart. When they climb from the river, her hair is a river where night has fallen, tangled with twigs and stars, parting like a path of escape. But in the very next shot, as they climb from the river, her hair is braided with wire and string. When he bangs on the rain-streaked window of the cab, yelling her name in a pivotal scene, briefly reflected in the window, in the rain, tangled with wires and stars above a river, is the hand of a fan or a stagehand or a bodyguard, body double, bystander, interloper, beloved ghost, and the two of us watching from a bridge on the far side. Okay. I think either one more or two more. My, my thing says one minute, so let's see what we can do here. This one is like the, these both are kind of first poems. This is kind of the official first poem of the book, and the one I'm gonna read you is like a poem before the first poem. So this is uh, Pseudochris Crucifer is the name of it. This one's also online. Pseudochris Crucifer is for my son. The father begins to make the sound a tree frog makes when he comes with his son and daughter to a pail of tree frogs for sale in a deep, so deep south flea market just before the last blood of dusk. A tree frog is called a tree frog because it chirps like a bird in a tree, he tells his daughter, while her little brother, barely four years old, busies himself like a small blues piper with a brand new birthday harmonica. A single tree frog can sound like a sleigh bell, the father says. Several can sound like a choir of crickets. 
Once in high school, as I dissected a frog, the frog opened its eyes to judge its deconstruction, its disassembly, my scooping and poking at its soul. And a little girl's eyes go wide as a tree frog's eyes. Some call it the spring peeper. In Latin, it's called pseudocris crucifer. False locusts, toads with falsettos, their chimes issuing below the low leaves and petals. The harmonica playing is otherworldly. The boy blows with his eyes closed. Some tree frog species spend most every day underground. They don't know what sunlight does at dusk. They are nocturnal insectivores. No bigger than a green thumb, they are the first frogs to call in spring. They may sound like crickets only because they eat so many crickets. Tree frogs mostly sound like birds. The tree frog overcomes its fear of birds by singing. The harmonica playing is so bewitching, the boy gathers a crowd in a flea market in the deep south. In the deep south. A bird may eat a tree frog, a fox may eat the bird, a wolf may eat the fox, and the wolf then may carry varieties of music and cunning in its belly as it roams the countryside. A wolf hungers because it cannot feel the good in its body. The people clap and gather round with fangs and smiles. The father lifts the son to his shoulders so the boy's harmonics hover over varieties of affections, varieties of bodies with their backs to a firmament burning and opening. You can find damn near anything in a flea market. Pets, weapons, flags, farm fresh as well as farm spoiled fruits and vegetables, varieties of old wardrobes, a rusty old tin box with old postcards and old photos of lynchings dusted in the rust of the box. You can feel it on the tips of your fingers, this rust, which is almost as brown as the father and the boy on his shoulders and the girl making the sound a tree frog makes in a flea market in the deep south before the last blood of dusk, just before the last blood of dusk, just before the dusk. And uh, this is the last one I'll read you. It's called American Sonnet for the New Year. And at the time I wrote it, I really did think, you know, it was going to be my last one. But it wasn't. And I'm also just playing around with adverbs, because, you know, teachers tell you you can't use adverbs anywhere. OK. Things got terribly ugly incredibly quickly. Things got ugly embarrassingly quickly, actually. Things got ugly unbelievably quickly, honestly. Things got ugly seemingly infrequently, initially. Things got ugly ironically, usually awfully carefully. Things got ugly unsuccessfully, occasionally. Things got ugly mostly painstakingly, quietly, seemingly. Things got ugly beautifully, infrequently. Things got ugly sadly, especially frequently, unfortunately. Things got ugly increasingly, obviously. Things got ugly suddenly, embarrassingly, forcefully. Things got really ugly regularly, truly quickly. Things got really incredibly ugly. Things will get less ugly, inevitably, hopefully. Thank you all. Do I sit? Thank you. No, okay, there we go. So I'm, I'm going to take privilege and ask the first question. Um, the, the Hall Waters Prize is a prize for excellence in Southern writing. And as I mentioned, you were born in Columbia, South Carolina. You went to uh, college at Pilford College. But you spent most of your career up in the north, Pittsburgh, and now in New York City. And I'm just wondering, do you identify at all as a southerner still? And are there specific echoes or aspects of your writing that you think of as tapping into that southern self? Um, I'm glad I read the Pseudocris Crucifer poem for you. When I say that's like in the first, the first poem in the book, it's like saying I am always talking to people about like the South. Uh, anytime I say I'm going to do like a, any religious reference, if I say, oh, this is a sermon that's coming from 
where I'm from. I feel like it's in everything. Um, I would say I don't really separate it out. I think it's just, it's there. I have to look at it closely sometimes in subjects, but I don't feel like I have to think too hard about it influence in the work. So I would say like, yeah, you know, that's really why I wanted to read with you so you can kind of see where that is and, and hear it, I hope, in, in the work. Uh, maybe not everybody hears it. Like if I'm reading certain things in California, they might think I'm unique and individual. But when I'm reading here, when I say, oh, I know who y'all are, I mean, you know that I'm responding to the same things you are thinking about or feeling sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Professor Hayes. Good morning. You have a new collection coming out in July called So to Speak. How do you think your poetry has grown in the five years since American Sonnets from a past, or, past and future assassin? And what, out of your many works, which collection do you view as your greatest accomplishment and why? Oh, wow. So the first one I can't answer. That's like saying, which of your kids are the best? Best not to answer that. Actually, you know what I can say? I mean, am I supposed to give some comments? I don't want to like give all my comments away too soon. Uh, I usually just think about like the last poem and the next poem more than the old poems because I, I feel like if you work on them hard enough, they'll do you know the work they need to do in the world without you. So I typically don't even read a whole bunch from the books that are in front of me. I'm mostly trying new stuff. I knew this would be different, so I'll say something about that if I have a chance later on. So about the the change in the books before the book of sonnets. I, w I had written a book called How to Be Drawn. I think it's out there. And really in that book and even in the other books, I'm often thinking about how to tell a story and sing at the same time, which some would say is the definition of a southerner. You know, like your accent is already singing and you're telling a story. So in a more kind of like, you know, when I'm teaching, I could say, Singing is like circular, like you're obsessed with something, so you keep saying it again and again. And a story is like a straight line. That's what that triangle is, like beginning, middle, end. So I'm always like, how do I do both those things? So really, all of my work is usually working in that regard, but then the election happened, and I sort of couldn't work on that. Like if I need quiet or if I need a prayer-like space to work, there was too much noise, there was too much upheaval in all kinds of ways, so I found myself writing those sonnets. And I will say, I didn't, yeah, I'm, I'm working on something else that has nothing to do with politics or anything else. Like that question of song and story is not about class, race, gender, culture, it's Terrence trying to work something out for himself. And that is really what wakes me up every day, certain questions like that. But I can be distracted. So I stopped that, I wrote these sonnets. Inside of the sonnets, I'm doing all kinds of things. Sometimes I'm telling stories like the story of like, did Jesus have a sister? You know, it's a question. And then these other kinds of things that I'm working out. And then sometimes you hear me doing music. At the last one with the adverb, I'm just wanting to do lee, 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 all the way through the poem. And then you get back to what I was working on. And that would be like the Pseudochrist Crucifer poem, maybe the continuity poem too, where I'm trying to again, talk about something while working on a formal question at the same time. So separate issues, right? I always do like left hand, right hand. Like one hand is just me waking up working out my own stuff, and the other hand is like the world saying, this is what I need you to think about. And so negotiating that kind of inside, outside question is how I typically work. Thank you. Wonderful answer, thank you so much. So in your poem on page 73 of American Sonnets for my past and future assassin, you say, that is. this country is mine as much as an orphan's house is his. Mm -hmm. In what ways have you used your poetry to try and bridge the gap between your own personal Americanness and the history of oppression in the country? Um, my Americanness and the history of oppression would be all on the same hand, so those, that wouldn't get be separated. But it would go back to what I said a minute ago, like the history of oppression, my body in this world, your body in this world, and then just like the abstract stuff, which is like how do you feel to be uncertain or in love or hungry or not want to go to work, like just the basic stuff, trying to give that shape versus this other question. You follow what I'm saying? Like, I don't think of myself and the history of oppression. I mean, it can't be if I'm in this body, like they are woven. But I have this other thing in me that everybody has. Like, you, some people call it soul. Some people call it the mind or consciousness, which is just, uh, you like stripes versus polka dots. You like spicy instead of sweet, like those kinds of things are as interesting and it's as generative for somebody that just wants to work every day, I think, wants to be creative every day. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, right? Was that yeah, Jeff? That's right. Yeah, okay. What was your name? Ashley. Ashley, okay, right. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Hayes, one of your poems from American Science from my past and future assassin, um, you write, why someone recounted to a church is beyond me. I would remodel Alabama. 
Mm -hmm. You also go on in the same poem to mention God several times. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about your relationship with Alabama specifically and perhaps how you perceive the uh, contemporary South's connection to religion? Um, See, sometimes I want to be like, that's already in the poem, you know? Um, maybe I started with that kind of comment of saying I'm always meditating on like spirituality versus religion. Um, so Alabama could stand in, that poem ultimately is about my mom and like walking on carpet thick as money, I can't remember everything in that. Uh, so the Alabama is a lead in into a broader question about the South and religion and my mother. So I would say, I, you know, there's another poem I wanted to read, I forgot to read that one from that book about another sonnet. But um, unpacking those things in a poem like the question of like, what was Jesus' sister like? When did she change water to wine? What, was, what is her name? Like that's always, again, those sort of like curiosity questions that only come because I was, I was raised in a certain environment, you know, raised Baptist, raised with certain kinds of ideas about what I can say and can't say. And, and fundamentally, I think as a teacher, um, not being able to ask him in church, like people saying, ask him in Sunday school. I'd be like, I want to ask the preacher, you know, right now when he's reading it. So thinking like that was the advantage of taking that stuff into art or taking that stuff into the more academic space where there is a more immediate opportunity to ask questions. Does that make sense? So you hear me asking certain questions or thinking certain things in a poem that I would maybe sometimes thought growing up in the South and felt like there was just never any opportunity to just ask questions. I mean, in this one book I have, it's a whole essay of like 180, 190 questions. The entire essay is made of questions because I'm like, what's, what, what's wrong with a question? A question can never really do any damage. It's the answers that mess people up. So I'm mostly always orienting all those questions. Spirituality, the South, Alabama, can, can it be changed? Can things be changed? What is a new model? Is that the future? Has it already changed? Questions, all questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. In your poem, How to Be Drawn to Trouble, you write, I've been playing Please, Please, Please by James Brown and the famous Flames all evening, and follow up with, I've got a lot of my, a lot of my mother's music in me. How has music, especially the kind of music featured in your childhood, influenced your work? And does it serve a purpose different from your references to the hip hop you yourself grew up on? Um, let's do music and poetry. So, uh, I, my, I don't want to go through all like my personal history, but I was not in a family where like, certainly people didn't read The New Yorker uh, or get music lessons. So I did chorus because I like music. And, that was the instru instrument I had, you know. Uh, once I got a little bit of money, the very first prize I won, uh, they gave me like $35,000 and I went and bought a watch and I bought a piano. And I started learning it, that was like 20 years ago. So I have a piano and I've been playing it for 20 years. I still only play for about three minutes before you realize I can't play it. But I'm like, that's fair. Uh, I ain't trying to master it, that's important to be said too. But the thing I think is that like it is all music, like is language music first or is music language? you know, like chicken or the egg kind of question. My sense of it is that like, language is the music that everybody has. Like you breathe a certain way, you talk a certain way. And when I'm talking about accents, like can you describe your own accent, questions like that. So for me, as a person who would not have gone to school without a basketball scholarship, my brother went in the army, uh, my stepdad was in the army, I think not, maybe one of my grandmother's children now since then and grand, none of my grandmother's children, maybe one of her grandchildren other than me has gone to college, you know what I mean? So having that instrument, it was like, well, I couldn't really be a painter. I was like, I can't really afford to do that. But having that instrument, much of my career has just been trying to see if language could be my music. If I could handle language the way that a person who did play the piano or did play the guitar plays that instrument, so hence the inflections and all the rhythms and the speeds and all the other things that happen. I am trying to make uh, uh, equality between language and music. Um, so Professor Hayes, you specifically have the experience of growing up as a black man in a religious sect of the United States. How does your experience as a religious black man change how you view others' works and how that gets filtered down into your own work? Uh, y'all asking me a lot of stuff about religion. Um, first of all, I would say like I would distinguish religion. I would not say I'm a religious black man. I would say I'm spiritual. Um, I saw this video where Tupac Shakur was in jail and they asked him if he uh, 
had a problem with like spiritual music and why he didn't write spiritual music as a hip hop artist. And he said, my music is very spiritual, it's emotional. That's what spirituality is. It's tied to one's emotional intelligence, said Tupac Shakur. So I repeat that now, and I like that definition as a way of understanding, yes, my relationship to religion is sort of like historical, right? Like it is, my culture is what I grew up in. Uh, when I go home, I still will go with my mama. She made me stand up in church, I start sweating. But I, you know, but the lot is full of a lot of buses, you know, going to the same definition, destination as I see it. You know, a Buddhist bus, a Jewish bus, a Baptist bus, an apostolic bus, a Pentecostal bus. And so I like to be in that lot looking at them. And I like the people that are getting on those buses too because they all have the same direction. But Terrence would mostly, you hear it in the poems, like a kind of ambivalence, a kind of like, you know, what Keats calls negative, negative capability, like being okay with not knowing stuff, you know, like comfortable in uncertainty, comfortable in anxiety even. So that would be my religion to like mortality. That would be my religion to what is on the other side. Like, oh, if I get on this bus, mm, maybe I won't be on this bus, I don't know. So I'm walking in the same direction as everybody in a very spiritual, open, emotional, even transparent so that I can ask certain things that maybe would be taboo and sorta of if I was in church with my mama, you know what I mean? And so that's what I would say. I would just distinguish in that question religion and spirituality and say like, yeah, I'm, you know, Marvin Gaye is very spiritual too, but you know, his daddy killed him. So it's a different kind of question of like the fixedness of a religion and the openness of a spirituality is what I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, Professor Hayes. Yes. There's the line that comes up in your poetry several times called um, that there's never been a black male hysteria. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the culture's attitudes towards African American men expressing raw emotions? And how does your work tackle this? Okay, good. So, like, yeah, um, this still goes to where poems come from. One of my gigs, uh, I work with this brother. I mean, there's all kinds of ways I could describe this. Like, we both got this job in this university. They hired two young black professors because they were like, one of them is going to leave and we'll still have one, so we'll still like make our quota. <laughs> and so they were even like, I, I won't go into all the details of that, but what I'll say is that you know one of us didn't survive. And so both of us were writers and the brother who really couldn't take it, I could see why he couldn't take it, but right before he vanished, he was saying he was working on his book called Black Male Hysteria. He suffered all kinds of like mental, I found out later that he actually came south to recover. Um, but he never published it because he couldn't do it. When I say this thing about like a certain environment, if there's a kind of loudness coming from politics, I have to listen to it and try to make some shape of that. Maybe that would have been true for him too in this fir our first kind of relationship to, these, to the university. And again, people respond differently. I, I sort of feel like my relationship to sports and being coached and having a dad that was in the military and a mother who did prison guards. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm a fairly tough person in terms of what that would have been like for my childhood. But it is a hard environment for everybody, you know, transitioning from whatever world you were to a professional world. And in this instance, it was the academy. And so he never made it. He, I lost track of him for a long, long time. And all I would say was, whatever happened to black male hysteria? In a very literal sense, like, what happened to that book that brother was going to write before he lost it? And so in the book, that question shows up because I kept trying to write the poem. Like, I was going to write a poem a day over four years. Sometimes I wrote two or three. I wrote them on my birthday. This was the American Sonnet. So everything stopped. The Pseudicus Crucifer poem, the continuity poems, the poems from How to Be Drawn stopped because I was like, every day I got to get this out with a sonnet. And every day, because that question had always occurred to me from those years ago, well, not every day, but occasionally, because that was a question that occurred to me occasionally, if it came up, it would have to be in a poem. And at the end, when I was putting the book together, just again, to make a very quick comment about how books are made, I was like, well, I don't have to choose one. They already got the same title anyway. So I thought that those, that recurring thing that I could not fix, which is to say, I don't even think those are the best poems in the book. I couldn't. If I had gotten it right, I would have only written one, right? And so I put them in there to create a kind of chain across the book to have you ask this kind of question, because I know it does resonate in a lot of different ways, like male hysteria, if you know the word hysteria, has like these gender sex things connected to it. It used to be a thing you only say about women. So I'm like formulating something that does not get fixed. That's what I'm saying to you. At the end, I still will probably have to write another poem about it and think about it more because of him, 
because of the question, because of the question you're asking me. So, you know, the poems don't necessarily have to end or fix things, hence the same titles. I'm suggesting it's ongoing even when you, you buy it or it's on the shelf. For the, for the maker of work, you can't really think of it as a product. You have to think of it as a kind of process. Thanks. After reading your 2006 poetry book called Wind in a Box and learning about your childhood through the text, I would like for you to once again step into the shoes of your younger self. If you could, which one of your collection of poems would you give to your younger self and why? Oh man, that's a hard question. I feel like that's a trick question. Um, I can give you a trick answer, which is like, my younger self is writing to me. My younger self was writing forward to this person who now has like children and is running around. And so that freedom, that world, it's almost like taking photographs or something. So myself now is still writing to a, somebody ahead of me. You know, I'm writing aspirationally to a person who maybe be smarter or a person who won't have as good a day as I might be having today and need to remember a good day like this. You follow what I mean? So even when I say like, even in my readings, I try not to read the books. I'll never do a selected, I hope, which is what people are asking me to do now. I'm like, you can do that when I'm dead. What you need me to put a selected for? <laughs> so I say to you, in my day to day, it's like last poem, next poem, last poem, next poem, more than reflecting too much on that self so that that self, even in the attitude, is always forward looking. Yeah. You titled a poem in your book, Hip Logic, Sonnet, yet repeat a single phrase. We slice the watermelon into smiles. This phrase evokes a simultaneous feeling of empowerment and conviction. But what was your goal with this poem? And simultaneously, how does experimentation factor in to your poetry? Um, it's good that you picked that poem. Yeah, I have a poem in my second book. It's the name of this sonnet. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. And the whole poem is, uh, we slice the watermelon into smiles, which scans. You know, it was a question, how about this? You know, like coming from the South, uh, having a, I say this fun, you know, I think people can, from Mississippi, I, I'm not gonna say Alabama. If I was in Mississippi, I'd say, I think people from Alabama would say it too. So instead I say, I think people from Mississippi say what people from South Carolina say. Like, I mean, in my new book, I have a poem called Strange is the Rules of Grammar because I'm like, I don't think I learned it right when I was in school, you know? And so, same thing, like to have grown up in the South, Nobody was that interested in poetry. Uh, nobody ever showed me how to scan a line, I have a pentameter, all this stuff. I knew that they rhymed, but I didn't understand anything else. So suddenly I'm in a graduate program. I had never taken any poetry workshops. It was just based on things I had written for myself in my classrooms. And an English professor was like, send this stuff, maybe they'll give you some money to go study poetry. And I was like, okay. So I get up there in my class. It's so funny, you know, it's an older poem, so I literally wrote it in my 20s as a grad student. But it was me saying, well, if every word is the same, if every line's the same, we slice the watermelon into smiles. Smiles rhymes with smiles. It's got to scan because it's the same sentence. There's my sonnet. So that idea really carries forward to the American sign all these years later, where I'm still saying, like, well, I still don't actually know everything I'm supposed to know about a sign, and y'all hear the connection. It's my education. Like, maybe people that grew up in other states had some better education. That's what they tell us statistically. You know, South Carolina's always at the bottom of, like, education. So I'm like, that's fine. I'll just do what we do here. We'll do the best we can. We'll be creative. We'll make it interesting. And we will not be limited by those kinds of limitations. So I'm talking to everybody in the room in that regard. So my relationship to the sonnet is like, well, I'm American. I know there's a Shakespearean sonnet. That's British, so what's the difference? Let me tell you the difference. So the Shakespearean sonnet, the British sonnet, is like 12 lines. They rhyme, and you're sort of thinking the thing. I love you, I love you, I love you. And then there's a volta at the end. There's two lines where you change your mind. That's where the sonnet turns. So in addition to rhyme and being about love, there has to be a volta. So in the Italian sonnet, it's, it's a little bit more uh, balanced because the English sonnet sounds like British people. That sounds like colonialism, that you think you write for 12 lines, and then for two lines, you'd be like, I might be wrong. <laughs> the Enlightenment sonnet, the Italian sonnet, is you think you write for eight lines. It's four, four, they're rhyme quatrains. Four, four, then you might change your mind, and it's six lines, that's 14, right? Three, three, and you out of it. So the Volta comes, not seven and seven, nobody says 50%. They're like, I'm almost right. And then they'll give you six lines to think about something else. You follow me? So I'm like, OK, Italian sonnet, English sonnet. What would be the American sonnet? One, you got a black president, then you got Trump. You're like, 
you know. So I'm like, it's got to have at least three voters in it in order to work as an American sonnet. Same question, what can I get away? I don't really understand it, but I know something about the form, but I'm gonna come up with something that makes sense for, again, what we do, you know, where we're from. We, if we don't have the resources, we give ourselves those, those sources. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Professor Hayes, uh, my favorite poem from American Sonnet for Past and Future Assassin, um, for my Past and Future Assassin, is one where you describe James Baldwin's face in uh, such a beautiful fashion. Uh, can you talk about some of your favorite, some of your favorite works from Baldwin and how you take inspiration from him or see it yourself as a kind of a part of the poetic tradition that he's part of? So y'all know I'm a teacher, so I'm gonna have to tell you something to go read. When James Baldwin first started writing, leaving Harlem, even before he got to uh, Paris, where he spent most of his life, his perfect professional life, he wrote this little short story called Sonny's Blues. So depending on the anthology, depending on like the politics of the people who would give you an anthology, that might be the one that you would get. And in this story, Sonny's Blues, written at the beginning of his career, it's about a guy who's maybe a teacher, he's a little bit depressed in the 50s, um, his brother has been in jail for um, heroin, and his brother gets out of jail, he's a jazz musician, he's a piano player, and as a bunch of stuff happens, they're kind of reconciling their relationship. At the end of that short story, he goes to hear his brother play. And it's this like holy spiritual moment where he's describing, you know, I don't know what much, most people hear when they hear music. And he's sort of describing that feeling. All Baldwin, it's amazing. It's lyrical, the sentences are amazing, make you want to weep. It's about like so many things going on, super tender. He could have stopped there. I mean, he was building his career. People were like, James Baldwin is the man. No politics in that. It's all about this very intimate moment between him and his brother and music. But if you go ahead maybe 10 years, 12 years, he wrote this story called Going to Meet the Man. It's a persona uh, story where he's in the voice of this white Southern sheriff who when he was a young boy, he went with his dad to see a lynching. So he's describing the lynching and he's describing all the kind of pervert, there's weird sex stuff going on for the sheriff who's grown up having seen that. And it's like extremely political, extremely uncomfortable. And again, depending on the people who put an anthology together, it just depends on the era. I think in, in a really liberal period, maybe that would be the story you would be giving the kids. That's not even like, I know this conversation is about critical race theory. It's not even really that though. Um, if we're talking about like why James Baldwin is super bad, why he's amazing, because he's trying to get us to have empathy. He's still doing the same thing. He's like, wants us to think about whatever psychic damage would have been done to any kid who would have seen something like that at, at a young age. And so still like humanizing the dude. I mean, you know, Baldwin grew up in the church. So again, inside of what he's doing is always a spiritual question. Always the question of like one's developing emotional intelligence. So the person that can do that, the person that can write at one hand, Sonny's blues, and then evolve or grow or just have the kind of like trifecta jumper and dunking quality of going to meet the man. I mean, I just can't think of that many people who so easily show you that you don't have to choose or that there's some middle ground or that maybe they still are both the same, that they're coming from the same spirit. So that's what Baldwin gives me. I mean, he gives us a bunch of stuff. You'll find him all over the place in terms of what he gives us. I can keep talking about him. But for me, just that little thing that said, you know who else is like that? Marvin Gaye. The distance between what's going on, political, social, and let's get it on. Same thing, <laughs> same thing. So that range is right, that range is human. You know, that, that range is like where we should be allowed to float, you know, between those two spaces. There are a lot of references to racial traumas present in your work. Do you feel as if poetry has the capacity to not only expose racial prejudice, but perhaps the power to reform systematic racism in America? I would put that next to what I was just saying about Baldwin. I mean, you could ask that same question of his work, since we could be doing it more retrospectively. Like, who knows about me? You know what I'm saying? Um, you could put that question to any body that's ever kind of explored those kinds of topics in the work and say, who knows, really? I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't sit down with that kind of pressure. I, I sit down in the body, you know, and so if I go out one day and the body feels like it's an obstacle for some people or a problem for some people, that'll probably show up in a poem. And if I go out someday and somebody's like, hey, how you doing? You know, isn't this great? That'll probably show up in a poem too. So I put that next to that question about Baldwin's capacity to like see his brother or see the brother and hear that music, but also the capacity to imagine something that's maybe trying to kill him, something that's just the opposite. So, yeah, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think that you hear what I'm saying with that one. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you mentioned earlier that your goal for writing American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin was essentially to understand yourself, your emotions, and your soul during the early years of the Trump administration. Um, and you mentioned just a moment ago to Mackenzie um, that poetry has the power of sort of drawing out everything around you. Um, do you think that art in itself has the ability to understand the deeper levels of emotion in a person, or is it all of a surface level idea of what you can comprehend yourself? Right, good question. The word that I use around sort of daily habits with the work is just witness. So I would use that more than like can, I mean I have this, this is a line in the, uh, in the new book, uh, I'm not trying to change the world, I'm trying to change myself so that the world will seem changed. So, you know, if you think that you're just trying to bear witness and maybe keep record of that, for me, that, that, that's the writing process or sometimes the drawing process, but I think for some people that might just be your camera phone, uh, it might be the notes on your phone, it might be your dinners at night, like how do you keep account of your days? Uh, Taco Tuesday, ta -da 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 -da. is that creative? It can be. I mean, creative is so much about, creativity is so much about like perspective on things, I think. So almost everything is a creative gesture if you can perceive it that way. So for me, the baseline that I can share with other people, the other stuff, you know, I'm gonna tell you, like even the genius stuff, I just be like, well, you know, the Thelonious Monk said, the genius is the one who's most himself. So Thelonious Monk, the great, the great amazing piano player's definition of genius, he was clearly a genius, is that he was just being himself all the time. And he was, he's very strange. He had these hats and he walked like that. He was all kind of crazy stuff going on. But he was a genius at being monk. And so I think that's a really great way of thinking of a word like that, that comes around sometimes. You know, I'm like, I just feel like you're just trying to like tap into, you know, your taste, your eyes, you're listening, you're taking things in and trying to give it some shape. Uh, and I think that that's what everybody's doing, honestly. I mean, some of us make, you know, a different kind of living at it, but all of us are really, whether we know it or not, trying to uh, keep track of things. If I go all the way back to the thing I said to you before, the only problem with me trying to keep a record is some days I want to sing and some days I want to tell a story. Different, different things, you know. So if I have enough time in one day, maybe I'll do both. I'll sing in the morning and I'll tell you a story about that singing at night. So I'm sort of saying like, if I'm only singing, it's almost not enough shape for it to be a good record to pass. It's maybe even more personal for me. But if I'm telling you a story, that is, that's for you. That's for the great storytelling tradition that has sustained mankind for the beginning of time. So that is the only thing that I'm really wrestling with. If I say to you, my core gesture as me is the same gesture as everybody else, which is just keeping a record of this little bit of time that we have. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hayes, there's a line in one of your poems in American Sonnets from a Pastor and Future Assassin where you have weddings, baptisms, and beheadings. And so I can see a theme in your work a lot where you have very celebratory or intimate themes connected with very disturbing ones. And I was wondering, is, is that a difficult connection to pull off? I mean, what inspires that, or how do you create those connections? So I read that one, and that was one of the ones that I was like saying, some days, if I was writing these things every day for two years, I would just try to define it. I would be like, what is an American signing again? What am I doing again? And then I would try. So in that one, the opening of that one is like a song has to have six sides to it. This is gonna sound super crazy, but. So my feeling is that, uh, not a box that the world is, but like a cube. And so if any response, so whether it's death, or whether it's love, or whether it's joy or anxiety, I still think of that as like size of a box. So you know, you think you're looking at the great wall of grief and there's no way to get around that. But then when you go around it, it's like, oh, it's not a wall, it's actually a cube. So six sides to almost any response to anything in the world is what I say. Like, how do you feel today? I can give you six different answers. I can give you my top answer, my bottom answer, my right answer, my left answer, my front answer, my back answer, six sides. So that still goes back to like, if you can get to the place where you live with every possible answer has six sides to it. First of all, you would only focus on questions, as I do, because if every answer's got six sides to it, but a question can be a question, let me really focus on questions. But that is what that poem is saying. So that's why you would get like a beheadings and baptism to same, because they're the same kind of gesture, like life and death depends on what side of the wall, what side of the box 
that you're on. Whether people would get that isn't as important to me as like being able to kind of quickly say it to you as a kind of equation. That's what the poem does for me. It allows me to be like, let me tell you, I think every answer has six sides to it, and I wrote it in a poem. Without the poem, it's gonna take a lot longer, it's gonna seem a lot maybe crazier. So the poem, again, is just organizing, it's answering that question inside of the poem. You see what I mean? Like it's sort of saying how I do think things overlap, that minute and minute are spelled the same and are really the same, that tear and tear are spelled the same and are really the same. So the poem itself, I hope all the individual poems are often answering you know, I probably had that question too, and it shows up in the poem, essentially. Great. I want to thank everybody for coming. Can we just have a round of applause? For thank you.